Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to Tea with Louise from the uh, Weirdly Cosmic podcast. And it's my uh, great pleasure to have Melanie Reinhardt here with me again today to talk over a few things. Um, I, well, it was actually one of my clients noticed something about Chiron. Uh, Chiron in Aries is exactly conjunct the upcoming eclipse. I knew that <laughs> it's exact to the minute, but um, a Chiron was also at this same degree, 19 Aries, when the nodes moved back into Aries and Libra and will be at 19 Aries when the nodes leave Aries and Libra and move back into Virgo and Pisces. So this degree is just like kind of just off the charts. So I had to ask Melanie if she could come and talk to me again. And luckily she was free. So we arranged it really quickly. But if you've not Melanie, not met Melanie before, um, I'd be surprised. But if you haven't, she wrote literally wrote the book on Chiron. So talking of tattered books, Melanie, this one's a little, <laughs> bit, more, a little bit more battered and things. So Chiron and the healing journey. And, and that title itself is very relevant to what we're going to talk about today. So thank you for joining me, Melanie. And um, I think we're going to start with um, reading the Sabian symbol. I'm going to get Melanie to read it for, um, for this eclipse degree, for this degree that is so important for Chiron's journey through Aries. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And um I, I just want to start by saying, you know, this book, look at mine, it's absolutely mm -hmm. falling. It's, um, <laughs> it's been out of print for a really long time. And very recently, it's just come back into print with Raven Dreams Press. You can get it in your usual bookstores or online at Amazon and so forth. Absolutely wonderful timing. And just to say... Um, in, in Dane Rajar's way of working with the degrees, a part of a degree, so, you know, usually you'll see a planet in, let's say, five degrees in 50 minutes. So the 50 minutes is counted as a whole degree because the thought is that it's already entered that, that field of that degree. And so it's Aries 20 that I'll be reading from. And the symbol, as described by Rodja, is a young girl feeding birds in winter. And his keynote right underneath that is overcoming crises through compassion. And the the keynote at the end of the uh, of the write up that he did is the transmutation of life into love. So he refers to natural se seasonal rhythms also imply an oscillation between living and dying. But through creative imagination, we can fly over the cycle and discover the means not only to escape from the fatality of seasonal decay or deprivation, but to assist other living beings to survive through crises. Um, and he also says, he refers specifically to emotional crises as well mm -hmm. and encouraging encouraging the creation of partnerships with other creatures unable to escape wintry deprivation or death. And through this, the life of the spirit, which is symbolized by birds, can be maintained through all crises. If, and that's in italics, if, mm -hmm. like a young girl, we are widely open to the promptings of love and sympathy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I... He also mentions um, 
the, a sense, a, a seasonal phase of impotency, you know, like winter coming on. You know, we can't like mm -hmm. do it often, <laughs> wind yes. back the clock. Uh, and there is a certain feeling of potential helplessness in that. And he says life potency in nature reaches a higher level in the human being meaning that we can encompass the opposites of living and dying. And, mm -hmm. yeah, mentioning specifically emotional crises as well. Mm. So I just thought that was such a beautiful symbol for such an interesting and potent point coming up very oh. shortly, you know. Oh, it 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 really is, you know, and I I love that it's a young girl as well because um, I yes. always think of I always think of Aries as as almost like the young child, the toddler kind of thing. When we are the young child, it's that new beginning, that sense of yes. freshness and and rebirth, and and, and also the oh. sense of innocence. Yes, you know that I've I've mm -hmm. always felt there is something very innocent mm -hmm. about Aries and. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just a, a, as a field, a sign it within is. the zodiac, something, yeah. something new and innocent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and that's that's sort of complemented by the fact that Aries is, of course, ruled by Mars, who is mm -hmm. the warrior god. So mm -hmm. there is a certain sense of becoming embattled that develops in Aries and yet there's something so fresh and innocent and straightforward mm. about, about the energy itself I'm there just really thinking is. of numerous friends that, that I have or have had who have the sun in Aries mm. and you know in yeah. some, of the, some of the old constellational books depict Aries as a lamb yes they do, don't they? Not the ram. Not the ram, it's but the, the young. lamb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you yeah. know, and a very, a very cute looking, um, innocent little lamb at that, you know. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, attached to that image is the sense of um, the, the devotional energy that's very strong in Aries. Mm. And you know, often it's that that kind of energy that can get the show on the road. You know, yes, sort of forward-looking, um, almost visionary energy, and being able to take action on it. Mm -hmm. So Aries, I, I I I kind of always think of Aries almost as like I I know exactly what I want, and I'm just going to go for it, kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> such sort clarity. Of, sort of never mind the fallout, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, Aries is not really a sign that cares too much about completing something and oh. achieving, you know. <laughs> no, no they do the not. the initial impulse. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, what, I, what I'm feeling just as I'm talking is, you know, the, the energy around that eclipse time and you know, wherever you're located, it might be worth looking up mm -hmm. how the eclipse travels in relation to where you'll be located and the and the hours where it might be visible. And there, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have to say, don't look at the sun without appropriate oh. protection. You can get proper eclipse glasses in numerous places. That you're sure to find them online. So don't you do can that. You can take them off when when the sun is completely covered, and that's quite yes. astounding. Yeah, it is quite mm -hmm. astounding. Yeah, so I'm actually amazing. traveling to see it. I'm traveling to Texas to see it. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> I was just going to say this this line of visibility. It sort of it it's mainly located in America, mm -hmm. North America, and it's it's it cut. You know the the place it sort of makes landfall on the east coast north northeast mm -hmm. coast, and then kind of sweeps down the in 
uh, uh, down the east coast and then move moves across. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. you don't have to be right under the eclipse line of the, of visibility to feel the no, effect. You do not. You, re you really don't. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the whole process lasts for several hours, but mm -hmm. typically the the point of exactitude is very short this um, one is this one's quite long I think yes yes yeah, so i think it's like four say, minutes yeah yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and so but you mm -hmm. can tune in oh a good mm -hmm. couple of hours beforehand yeah. yeah and um you know and that is wherever you are in the world mm -hmm. and there is a marvelous website called timeanddate.com Oh, that's amazing! Yeah, and it's got a whole, it's an oh, amazing website too. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's got a whole section on eclipses, and typically mm -hmm. they they live stream every eclipse. So if you're yeah. a very visual person, and you want to really track it, they probably start the live stream at least. They usually start it, you know, a couple of hours before, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they ha they have their team of photographers all over the world you know mm. so you, you can see the entire thing from several viewpoints sometimes and it's a wonderful website and I think it also it tells you you know if if you're like me um living in northern North America then you know it shows you know where you'll see partial as well if you're exactly if you're under, and, and they yeah. have maps yes yeah. maps. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, but but Melanie's right. You know, this this eclipse. Um, the more I kind of tune into the energy of it, is not only is it in Aries, which is the first sign, you know, and we've talked about that energy of Aries, the new beginnings. It's yes. at night. It's at nineteen degrees, which is I've mentioned with where Chiron was when the nodes moved into Aries. So an eclipse, by the way, is a new or full moon that's on the nodes um i won't explain all of the astronomy but that's basically why what makes it an eclipse because it's conjunct the moon's nodes and so yes. that but 19 is a one you know so that's a new beginning so it's the first sign at a one new beginnings there's also 19 is numeral in numerology is a one and a nine so beginnings and endings of cycles this, yes, this, and you know this. the cycle of eclipses uh, mm -hmm. is is nineteen years. Yes, so yeah. that's an, another thing that <laughs> it, if you're interested in sort of tracking things, as I certainly am, yeah. that you can look back nineteen years, and it'll be almost to the day. You'll mm -hmm. find another eclipse in almost the same place, and yep. you can go back even another nineteen years, and and you, you'll see that. So mm -hmm. eclipses are not solitary phenomenon in any way. They have a mm -hmm. cycle like everything in astrology does, really. And that's another very interesting thing. So let's just do the maths. Um, it's two, 2005. 2005. Yeah. yeah, 2005. Five. Yeah. Yeah. But that one did not have Chiron conjunct. <laughs> exactly. No, no it yeah. didn't fit. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and so, the, other, the other thing that yeah. I'm in, very interested in, have been for years, is, you know, this transition from Chiron in Pisces to Chiron in, in Aries. I mean, it really is world shaking. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back to previous transits of Chiron in Pisces, just in the 20th century. So many of you listening might be old enough to remember the transit of Chiron through Pisces in the 1960s and that was at, let me just look up my notes here yeah, that was in 23-ish of Pisces uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the 13th of April 1966 so it'll be about four years before we have another one of those conjunctions but what seems incredibly interesting to me 
is, you know, of course, the 1960s um, as a whole, you know, it's kind of thought of as the age of flower power and make make love, not war, and all these things, which are Ooh, so... 60, 66, 66 was quite different, really, wasn't it? Well, exactly. <laughs> that, 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 that was the shift. And then there's a whole sequence of major events which, you know, just scanning over mm -hmm. them and, of course, mm -hmm. considering them as manifestation in the collective of how the energies were turning at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the 60s began with, you know, the Beatles and the age of flower power and all of that. Mm -hmm. Then came... Chiron Saturn in Pisces, 1966. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the 60s, um, Chiron went into Aries in April of 1968. Mm -hmm. And then all, all the major sort of epoch-making events that followed after that were almost like the crash landing of all mm. of that optimism and hope and idealism and ex expansion mm. and opening on all sorts of levels. It was like a progressive crash landing of that. Mm. And of course, that was also the decade of the first moon landing. Of course. And yeah. that came, that was also part of the turn, as I would read it. And then there was the Woodstock Festival and uh, the musical Hair. And all these things. And then the whole tragic side of, of it started to peep through. And by the end of the 60s, there was the terrible Charles Manson massacres that went on. Oh, yeah. And the big free rock and roll concert at Altamont where someone was mm -hmm. killed. Killed. And yeah. there was a lot of injuries and it... Um, Apparently, the, uh, the the management enlisted the help of the Hells Angels, the local chapter, for yeah. security, for various complicated reasons. But it's almost like if you read an account of how all that happened, you can see that it was kind of ill-starred, as it were, right from the start. Mm -hmm. and so there came in a mood of absolutely massive, disappointment mm -hmm. absolutely huge and you know that's that's an that's a feeling an emotion which most of us don't do very well with it's very hard to re yeah. receive and accept and really feel it through and if it isn't felt through it turns into a kind of militancy which mm -hmm. again is a, that's another face of aries but I'm so fascinated by how the, how those link together mm. and the emotional processes. Um, if they're externalized, they can be absolutely disastrous, you know? Mm -hmm. And just to add to, to everybody listening, Chiron's cycle is about 51 years. So yes. um, I think it's wonderful to have Melanie here to talk about the history of the, that last shift from Pisces into Aries. This one began in 2018, right, Melanie, when Chiron? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back during the times of the First World War, Chiron was in Pisces through that whole war uh -huh. and went into Aries mm, in 1919. Or hotly mm -hmm. followed by a pandemic, an influenza pandemic, ah. <laughs> that is reputed to have killed more people than the entire World War I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I died. believe it did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's also, you know, that poignant reminder of it, the fact that it is sometimes through illness that trauma gets processed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially as, you know, back First World War, that was long before the term 
of the abbreviation PTSD. That didn't yeah. even exist back then. Mm -hmm. There was just this condition vaguely called shell shock. And so yeah. lots and lots of extremely deeply traumatized people mm -hmm. came back from the war. Uh, and then there was a pandemic. You know, it kind of makes sense. And it and feels like a bit, a little like our times. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. You know, that second half of the 60s, of course, that was a particular phase in the benighted war in Vietnam. Of course. Um, and that was just a so the My Lay Massacre was one of the most famous episodes that really started to turn the tide. Mm. Um, and that was in that was in, in 1968, so that was all part of that turning of the tide. Mm -hmm. But I, I do feel that th this emotion of disappointment, which, you know, Pisces was traditionally ruled by Jupiter, Mm -hmm. since Neptune was discovered I think of them as co-rulers not one or the other you know I do too yeah oh good I'm, I'm glad to hear that <laughs> mm -hmm. and so the, the, this theme of disappointment um, seems to me to be really important to both via, mm -hmm. both via both of the rulers Jupiter and Neptune and so we ha how we handle our disappointment may make the difference between um, kind of holding a nameless pain that creates a situation where we're more likely to just project onto other people mm -hmm. and then battle them mm -hmm. uh, or direct hatred and judgment and everything else to them. But the, the tracking of disappointment means that we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. and so that's almost like the Sabian symbol there, isn't it? It is. Oh, I've I've lost it in this maze of. Oh, <laughs> lost it. Well, it's do we? Well, yeah. It talks about not only escape from the fatality of seasonal decay or deprivation, yes, yes, but exactly. yeah, but to assist other living entities to survive through crises, which of course yes. Chiron. Chiron's role um, really was as a teacher and mentor and healer and medicine man. Exactly. And through through his own loss, he, he saved Prometheus, right? So, you know, he, he kind yeah. of, yeah, through his own disappointment and pain he, he and sacrifice, if you like. So it's a very kind of sacrifice sacrificial um but not in the way some of us these days think of sacrifice it's kind yeah. of just saying you know my loss is your gain if you like so i can help you from what i've learned from my loss if you like so <laughs> does that yeah yeah absolutely uh -huh. and also uh -huh. you know if one can feel that the difficult feelings around disappointment mm. It also short circuits the tendency to blame. Yes. So to blame another person for my suffering or for my misfortune. Yes. Or also to blame myself, mm -hmm. which can be equally um, hazardous, you know. And also blame goes nowhere, really, because it leads yeah. to more desire for punishment and all the rest it of it. It does. But there's but a soft the... quality to Also, disappear. perhaps... Or but also perhaps the tendency to think there's somebody else or something else gonna save you. The savior yeah, thing. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah. They, go, they go together, don't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So what's what's your thoughts on um, you know, generally um in modern day astrology, because since Uranus was discovered in 1781. We've realized that when these energies come into our human consciousness, we kind of the, the energy of them is more. So both those periods you've looked at, we didn't know Chiron existed, right? So, exactly. 
and I do very much think of Chiron as the the bridge between the visible planets mm -hmm. and the invisible planets. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a way in which the processes which are represented by the outer planets are, are very rarely something which we can integrate directly at mm -hmm. a personal level. Um, often, the energies are more noticeable as they spin out into the collective. Mm -hmm. You know, in historical events of one kind or another, and all, almost invariably, what we see out there is the kind of upside down and backwards version of what's really going on, mm. because they they are they are pretty high voltage energies, so to speak, and they are also energies which are meant to take us beyond our own sort of crystallized ego patterning. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it can happen that they crash into that, and that is like a crisis. Yes. Uh, and it can take a very long time to integrate because it's almost like we naturally go into fright and defensiveness because it's mm -hmm. too much. It's overwhelming. Yes. And, and so, you know, enter Chiron. Yes, in 19, 1977, by the way, he was uh, uh, yes, um, exactly. discovered by us oh, and, November oh, the 1st. Yeah. This is a little Gemini digression here, if you don't mind. No, my Gemini I, I, moon I, I, loves digressions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a little event happened earlier in the week that was so charming, and yet I had a feeling there was some kind of deeper meaning to it. And it was mm -hmm. the following day that you emailed me to ask me if we could oh. have a conversation about this this week. So what happened mm -hmm. was I was on a Skype call with a friend. And for various reasons, we were also exchanging messages in the chat. So she, she typed something for me in the chat. And the way that came through on the microphone, I thought, oh, my God, it's like, it's like, I first thought, oh, it's like the hooves of horses on the keyboard. And she's a very fast, oh, yeah. it's not like me, I'm pretty slow. Uh -huh. And so I was sitting there sort of musing with delight about <laughs> this sound of like a herd of horses. Oh, lovely. Going over the keyboard. Uh -huh. And then I thought, oh, it's centaurs. And <sighs> once once we made that connection, well, we oh. absolutely laughed and we laughed and we laughed so much. And so I, I was typing all kinds of things that I didn't really need to type, but just so that it was like the exchange between these horses on either side coming through the chat, you know. Oh, I love that. I love and that. And it was so funny. We ended up just absolutely laughing and laughing. And it was a conversation that had started out, you know, on quite a serious tone. And by the mm -hmm. end, we were just absolutely falling about, you know. And I went wow. to bed thinking of the centaurs and thinking, I'm sure there's another meaning other than just this delightful comedic exchange that I had with a friend, you know. <laughs> and then well, when, I opened, um, when I opened my computer in the morning, I saw the email from My you. email. <laughs> oh, I knew there was something else. <laughs> they, they were kind of making their horse music over Skype. Oh. And uh, now... Well, now I have to tell you... I have to tell you, Melanie, over the recent months, really, since um, since we last talked and since I've been working more closely with the centaurs, and that happened really after my Caritlo return, and we'll talk about her in a minute, because yes, um, yes. because my Caritlo, um, we ha each have a Caritlo return, which is Chiron's wife, um, around age 62, 63, and, and so when I had that, they really came online for me the yes. centaurs but speaking of the horses kind of that feels like they are in my brain most of the time and yes. the, kind of the message I, I overall get from from the centaurs and how they're working us since 
Chiron's discovery in at the end of 77. And then Pholus was next, right, in 92. Um, mm. And that was the year as well that Chiron crossed it within the boundary of Saturn and came into our visible orbit, if you like. Um, anyway, and as as each one's come online, it just seems like the the healing that they are bringing is us getting in touch with our animal side. So centaurs are half human and half horse. So half animal and half um, really the higher kind of rational brain. And everything has been kind of flooding into me. So forgive me if it seems a bit Gemini moon scattered, but everything <laughs> I... <laughs> everything I to another. <laughs> yeah, everything I read, uh, books like not just astrology books um 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 i actually entered therapy again because of something that happened in my life and i'm doing internal family systems therapy i don't know if you've heard of it parts work mm -hmm. everything is all about descending down into our human side after yes. centuries of thinking that everything was about our mind and everything was about rational or um, everything was about, I think, therefore I am, which mm. is really the top half of the centaur. It's kind of like Chiron came in, you know, into our consciousness. He was in Taurus at, mm. um, on the, in the discovery chart, which I think of as the most earthly sign. Um, mm -hmm. the one that's connected with nature and animals and and our interconnectedness as as messy human bodies. Mm -hmm. I really think that's what we're being called to do in, with these centaurs. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. You know, it's mm -hmm. also interesting thinking about Chiron's movement is mm -hmm. uh, Chiron in in 2021 in late may was at a point in its orbit called the aphelion which simply means that that was the time when chiron was the furthest away from the sun um so you know all planetary orbits are ellipses it's like a flattened circle um some very elliptical and some not so much but this, all the centaur's orbits are very elliptical. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is if we think of the sun as a constant, which, of course, in fact, it's not. The whole thing is moving no. in space <laughs> at this dizzying speed. I never remember the numbers. because I don't either. I but... <laughs> think about it, you know. But anyway, if we think of Chiron as, as moving further away from the sun, and then eventually kind of turning around and beginning the part of its orbit where it comes in much closer to the sun. So the sun does carry really important symbolism. Apollo was a sun god and the mentor of Chiron. So Chiron was yes. raised by Apollo, who taught him all kinds of amazing skills, including mm -hmm. the healing arts, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there is this this kind of indigenous energy in the, yes. in the centaurs that does relate to the centaur sign of the zodiac, which is Sagittarius, yes. in the sense of future orientation, of seeking and mm -hmm. going further and looking at the horizon, not the ground mm -hmm. kind of thing. And that is both the gift of Sagittarius and also it's vulnerability mm -hmm. because um, I think I put this into my book. But anyway, there's a poem of D.H. Lawrence where he speaks about it's only when you give up seeking that you will find. And to me, that's very Chiron because that's it's all why here. that drive <laughs> to follow our energy out there and mm -hmm. away and just out into the world mm -hmm. that can really intercept our capacity to be mm -hmm. quietly with ourselves or with a situation anchored mm -hmm. 
in her own heart, which of course is associated with the sun, via the sign yeah. of Leo. Um, so and now, inc oh, incidentally, talking of, of the heart and, and the sign of Leo and the sun, I work with the Venus star point work as well. Um, yes. And the last, ve well, the current Venus star that we're under was at 20 Leo um, yes. in uh, in a, a lovely supportive fire trine aspect to this eclipse where Chiron this, is now. this eclipse point. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so I, I like to imagine Chiron coming through the very end part of Pisces, and I think that's where the disappointment is so important. Mm -hmm. Coming mm -hmm. through that and, you know, continuing on and up and out mm -hmm. to search and search and search. And it's at the perihelion point that that direction changes. And from 2021, it's mm -hmm. as if Chiron's orbit is drawing closer and closer in to the sun, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. we can certainly take as a point of individual light. And so all the searching out there and putting one's energy out there mm -hmm. turns around. Mm -hmm. That happened just a couple of years ago, and maybe many of you felt that. What I'm also very aware of is, particularly in the last decade, but not it didn't suddenly spring out of nowhere, but there are numerous people now really working in the field of trauma. Yes. And really I was about to mention well, this is the the, the internal family systems is excellent uh, uh, for absolutely. trauma healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there are many fine teachers now mm -hmm. um, in print and online mm -hmm. who are who are working with wisdom about that background yes which of course does also spill into history and what happens in history mm -hmm. you know it's almost as if the, the wheel of history turns on the unprocessed trauma yes. of the of the previous lot of people and you um, know but, uh, there, there are many things one can say to contest that but it's a very mm -hmm. interesting way of looking at it and certainly on an individual level, the means by which we can better process our own trauma mm -hmm. um, is becoming available. And the mm -hmm. awareness about that whole process Definitely. is it's very high now out, out mm -hmm. in the collective, which is amazing. And I also, so yeah, there's Gabor Mate for one, Richard Schwartz, who who yes. created inter, uh, internal family systems, and incidentally, he uh, he came, he said that came to him in a download, really, or series yeah. of downloads in the early '80s, just after Chiron's discovery. So you know, there's the um, there's the influence of Chiron coming in again kind of almost downloading this yeah, these new ways of healing and healing generational multi-generational traumas as well exactly so yeah. um, also to mention here the work of daniel thor dr mm, daniel. yeah mm -hmm. uh, you can see from his marvelous book ancestral medicine if you look at mm -hmm. the practice piece you see he was born in 1977 Oh, he was. Oh, wow. He was. And <laughs> I almost think of him as the voice of Chiron because he's really yeah. working from such, uh, such a kind of new but ancient mm. cosmology or understanding of how these things all link together, you know? Yeah. Very, I think I really do think of him as the voice of Chiron. Definitely. And and just uh, I'm a, a trained shamanic pra practitioner amongst many of, of my other kind of things that I've studied and trained in and 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 worked with, and the the rise in people who are turning to um, understanding the the shamanic practice. Just I don't mean they're becoming shamans. Oh, yes. I don't mean I, I don't mean everybody's you know becoming a healer. It's more like we're becoming our own healers by learning to tune into that those kind of realms, that kind of more indigenous, as you said, realms. Yes. Yeah. yes. 
And that kind of brings me to Chiron's wife, how she's working with Carico, uh, how yes. she's working with her husband. So, oh, um, so something I can't wait yeah. to tell you. Oh, no, I you only, go on in that then. Yeah. I only noticed this recently. Um, so I was talking about the app Helion where Chiron was mm. and the turning point and so forth. Uh, and so the perihelion is the opposite. Mm -hmm. the Chiron is the closest into the sun. Mm -hmm. so that happened, last happened, on the 14th of February, 1996. One year later, exactly, uh, Cariclo. Cariclo was yeah. discovered. I nearly fell off yeah. my head when I saw that. Oh, wow. I've been I've been searching before. <laughs> I've been searching for that date, but not only that, didn't it? Didn't um, before that, as as Chiron was approaching that point, he crossed the the orbit of Saturn at six degrees Leo, which was the discovery degree of yes. of his wife of yes, his wife exactly yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, and yeah. and then w when Chiron came out of that um, visit to the inner side of Saturn, mm -hmm. that was in early Sagittarius, and that's where the 1949 mm -hmm. conjunctions of Chariclo and Chiron yes. had, had occurred. Yeah, it was just it's amazing kind of weaving, you know. But what I... came to my mind uh, with this, um, so. Uh, the Chiron reaches perihelion, so mm -hmm. it makes the long journey from having all the energy going out there mm -hmm. uh, and begins to draw that within as the orbit begins to get closer to the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's right where it's in the innermost point. That's when Chariclo comes into the picture. Yeah. And I just thought, what a teaching that is, because so often, in many, many ways, but certainly in the ways of looking for relationship, mm -hmm. is, we have so many projections going out there, so many oh. hopes, wishes, and ideals, and things that mm -hmm. where, that mean all our energy is going out, so to speak. Yeah. And it's almost like once that lands back in our own heart, Mm -hmm. The space opens where not just our one special relationship, but all our relationships kind of shift level when that starts mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. And I just thought that was absolutely wonderful. And, and speaking about kind of my own life journey a little bit with with um, this journey of Chiron in within to Saturn's orbit, and in the early 90s, and then the discovery of his wife, Cariclo by us, with a beautiful balanced six pointed star chart. We won't, we've talked about that on the last interview, yeah. which I'll link to on this one, but there's so much we could say. Um, in, the, in that period, I actually spent, um, consciously chose to spend a few years um single celibate on my own find I I literally described it as finding myself yes. and I've I've long since said that if you do that if you're healthy and happy and whole within yourself you can be in healthier relationships for with others so it speaks to that finding that somebody else to complete you or save you that's never going to happen you can't yeah. be in healthy yeah. relationships unless you are help in a good relationship with yourself so you know my own life journey kind of time-wise actually um aligns with that <laughs> yes and um, i'm sure you've probably uh, experienced this too is talking to many people you know for readings and things like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where it's like that the soul is prompting them to have a period of mm -hmm. Solitude, yeah, and even celibacy sometimes, yeah. But you know, other aspects of them are kind of fighting this. Oh yeah, because it's not really socially acceptable to do that. No, um, because often you know the the world sees things in terms of 
mm -hmm. successful couples or failed couples. I know. But not in terms of singletons, you know, to use an yeah. astrological word. And what I've noticed is that people are accepting this more and more now. Yeah. And that helps you, people to accept it in themselves, of course. You know? I've all but I've also found you can do it even if you're in um a relationship, you know, in a couple. I've now been married right. twenty seven years with my we're on our our relationship Saturn return. And we went and we went through a rocky patch because various reasons I don't need to go into. And uh, instead of focusing on going out there and kind of having a mediator kind of make us thrash out things, I just focused on my my own healing and things turned around. It's just, yeah, you know, <laughs> I became happier in myself again and the relationship is fine now so anyway <laughs> so I actually I'm I'm a terrible astrologer in many ways I I kind of tell people I say don't ask me about the other person I said it's all in you exactly. <laughs> I don't look at them <laughs> yeah yeah mm -hmm. so I kind of think astrology um, at least the counseling kind of astrology that I practice um, is moving more to just focusing on that person, finding the self in the middle of the chart, if yeah. you like, which is very, which is very uh, centauric to my mind as well. So, it, yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. also, um, you know, get given a chance, most people will speak their Chiron. So you don't have yes. to figure, you don't have to figure out what this particular individual Chiron is about. No, but be, being given that space, people will very often just speak from that place. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go back to Cariclo a little bit. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah, since their conjunction, before we knew they existed, <laughs> and that was in 1949. Um, as as uh, as you said, was that in Sagittarius? I can't remember where the conjunction. Yes, it was. Yeah, mm -hmm. in early Sagittarius, and there were three. Yeah. yeah, three of those conjunctions that pretty much dominated 1949. Yeah. Which doesn't surprise me with my Sagittarius stellium that they speak to me as a pair. <laughs> Yes. But anyway, <laughs> but since 90, 1994, 95, the two have been really in a sextile pretty much, kind of yes. waning, which a sextile is a 60 degree aspect, by the way. So that it was exact in 94 and 95 and is going to come back to several exact 60 degree aspects from 2028 to 2033 I think um so they've really been in this very supportive dance with each other because the yes. 60 degree aspect is a supportive aspect but yes Karen, and of course, of course yeah. it absolutely features on the the chart for her discovery it does it's the in there trail yeah. of uh -huh. 60 degree aspects all the way around the chart and it's it's sort of complete it's a complete yeah. hexagram, you know. It it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. But I'm not going to show it again. I, I know I'd be tempted to, but we'll get lost. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yes. but 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 Cariclo is in Aquarius and has been in Aquarius for quite a while. And she, I can't remember when she moved in. Do you remember? Don't remember no. exactly. No, I can look it up while I talk. But um, I've heard you mention it, and I've often. Um, Kind of thought it uh, myself as well. Carrie Clo is is this spinner of grace. She's the space holder. She's she's that I always see her as the weaver and spinner of new stories and or yeah. spinning spinning the threads of the old stories to create something new, like a a, a big rug. And um, Aquarius is a sign we're moving into the age of Aquarius. We most people know that. And um, I always think of her as uh, kind of just sitting there spinning these old indigenous ways into a new way 
to move forward in a very futuristic way because we we can't go back we're not going to go you know back to uh, the old days or kind of things like that so we kind of have to, are being called in Aquarius to really kind of um create a very different way we've been given this opportunity uh, so she moved in in 2021 by the way into um into Aquarius so we're in the sign of the water bearer and she's holding space and here we have um, Chiron in Aries which is really that little girl the I am kind of energy as well that very clear new beginning and the two are working together in my opinion to kind of help us really fully move into this new paradigm we're moving into so I'd love your thoughts on that <laughs> well um you know Chiron was discovered physically um, when it was in between Saturn and Uranus. Mm -hmm. So um, as Louise mentioned, you know, Chiron does go through the orbit of Saturn. And so for about 20% of its orbit, oh, no, I'm not sure of that figure now, but anyway, it spends part mm -hmm. of its orbit um, in between Saturn and Jupiter. So mm -hmm. technically sort of an inner planet. And then it goes to be an outer planet between Saturn and Uranus. So Saturn is the edge of the visible mm -hmm. world. And Uranus is the edge of the invisible world. So Uranus was the first planet to be discovered with maths and technology, not just from the visual sight. Mm -hmm. So that's an enormous edge between two completely different perceptions of the world or knowledge of the world and um, the old ruler of Aquarius was Saturn mm -hmm. and when Uranus was discovered as Louise mentioned in 1781 uh, it was attributed by some astrologers to Aquarius mm -hmm. me I like to think of, think of it as a both and I do yeah. I don't think that Uranus replaced Saturn at all. I don't. I don't. I think <laughs> the dialectic between them is what's obvious in the sign of Aquarius. And that dialectic can be pretty rough, actually, mm -hmm. because Uranus is an energy that seeks to release bound energy. And that often, what's that phrase? Yeah, to make an omelette, you've got to break the eggs. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right if you're the omelet, but what about if you're the egg? No, <laughs> no, you know. So, in other words, the action of Uranus does tend to activate our fear and defenses, which is the Saturn mm -hmm. side of things. So, so to me, the the energy of Jericho in Aquarius it opens ways of being where we're not just ping-ponging between these radical opposites. Mm -hmm. Now, Chiron goes through the orbit of Saturn, and to me, that's very much an indication of, you know, bringing our Saturnian defences, fears, rigidities, all those things, mm. bringing those into the healing field. Yes. Um because uh, without that, you know, Uranus would just be this dizzying leap into yes. the new, new paradigms, new this, new that, new clothes, new boyfriend. Just Saturn, is, Saturn is the steady hand saying, hold on. Exactly, Saturn <laughs> says, wait a minute. He's also the <laughs> lord of time. Mm -hmm. So Uranus operates not in the world of time which is part of the real crash that can happen mm -hmm. with Uranus when we get carried away by an idea and an or and or an mm -hmm. ideology. So the idealism, the vision of the future, and so forth. Um and like get like maybe getting too carried away with the AI thing, maybe for example. Oh, that's, yes. That's, oh, and not you know, only that, you know, I keep Every time I listen to anything political <laughs> on the radio, oh, 
And I do limit yeah. that because otherwise mm -hmm. the world seems so mad. I think, no, wait a minute. I know. I can't be hearing what I'm hearing, you know. But, mm -hmm. you know, what mostly, uh, I'm going to say mostly well-meaning, but maybe some not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sort of visionary politicians. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the, the interest rate is going to fall and the uh, everybody's mm -hmm. income is rise. And, uh, I mean, just this storm of ideas which are no more than that it's their ideas yeah uh, and you know then where whereas saturn's kind of saying there's something to be said for keeping some of the old traditional ways and exactly ways. so you know yeah, yeah the, the, <laughs> the middle ground between those two mm -hmm. is often very elusive mm -hmm. but in my mind if i think of chiron as being very important in that space mm -hmm. Uh, so often, either to get all cramped up and defensive, or to be over eager and leap into yes. the future, they're both defenses against things that are painful within us that need attention, mm -hmm. and that's where Chiron mm -hmm. comes in. Yes. But also, Chariclo moves between Saturn and Uranus, but she doesn't cross over either of no. them. So it's like her space is in that medium space. Between. She pulls the two together. Kind of. Exactly. Yep. And she mm -hmm. is in that space where neither of those two dominate. Mm. And so in Aquarius, um, I think her her action, so to speak, is is very strong and sometimes very obvious. Mm. Yep. And yeah. It's as if there's an empty space that we need to find in between those two. Often mm -hmm. they cannot be reconciled and tied up in a neat little bundle and understood. No. Because no, they are not. irreconcilable opposites and we have to be able to accept that. And the space that can open um, mm -hmm. as regards Sharikla is something that may be very, very small, very quiet, very personal, but that has this encompassing kind of energy, and it can be very still. Mm -hmm. And still doesn't mean that you don't do anything. <laughs> it means exactly, that the, that the space out of which you do things has this particular sense of clarity. You know, mm. I also have seen Sharikla, the graceful spinner image. I've seen her work in transits by being an energy that actually unspins where things are mm. all knotted up. Yes. And initially mm -hmm. that can feel quite dramatic. Yeah. But again, there's an invitation to be quiet and allow the inner process to do its own thing. You know, we don't have to do it all, you know. Mm. Um, and so that's some something about how I feel mm. uh, this energy, and I think you know with them sextile. That's mm. so interesting because and they've um, just they've been they've just been working together for so long. But you know it's yeah. interesting that after we speak and after this eclipse that's on April the eighth, it's only four years till they start exact sextiling again to each other and really yeah. start to. Um, kick in but I want to mention you to you another thing that I've been looking at and working with is the six degree Aquarius mark um, yes so six degrees Aquarius is opposing the of, of the degree that um, Cariclo was discovered at at six Leo and it's the south node of the USA chart now I'm not going to get political but I am going to say you know uh, clearly, you know, this eclipse is right over the USA. It's the third e to, uh, solar eclipse, sorry, since 2017 to go right through the USA. And that's it till the 2040s. No more total eclipses over the USA. And clearly the USA is kind of the fulcrum point of some of the global turmoil that's <laughs> happened uh, politically and, and energetically. You know, people have split, families have split since all this turmoil 
all this separation since the pandemic. So it's um um it's just obvious. Well, I kind of think like this eclipse is going to change things. But it be this began with this six Aquarius point. And I'm just going to show you my slide, uh, Melanie. And I keep finding more no, points. No, I there keep... was a, there was a conjunction of um Nessus and Chiron. Oh, see, I didn't know about at, that. One. At, at at that degree, at six Aquarius, I'll find yeah. where that one was. Yeah, it was. But, but, yeah. but to show everybody else as well, though. Um, at uh, when Uranus, the modern ruler of Aquarius, was discovered, oh. Plu Pluto was at the six Aquarius. Pluto will return to that point in February of 2027. Wow. So then we've had all these other conjunctions at six or seven. I put some um, things together. Um, and then this is where Chiron crossed Saturn's orbit in oh, 1992. Wonderful, wonderful. I know. I mean, I'm just like blown away. But looking forward, you know, um, well, this year we just had a Venus Mars conjunction at six Aquarius, too. And then, then we've got the Pluto return to uh, six Aquarius in 2027. And then in 2028, when Cariclo and Chiron start sextiling exactly again, we've got a series of conjunctions at six and seven degrees Aquarius again. Wow. I just, I'm just like. Absolutely the, the, wonderful. <laughs> so it was Nessus and Chiron, you said, were. Um, yes. Uh, I'm yeah. not sure if it was exactly six degrees, but I think so. But yeah, but. It was so 1954-ish. That was a conjunction of Pholus and Chiron in Aquarius. Oh, and I well, think I'll have to look at those. Degree, it would be worth worth checking. Yeah, I'll look into those. But but I just want people, you know, I don't want everybody to get um, tied up too much in the USA and things. But it has been the leader of the free world. The lead, you know, it, the USA had the doctrine of discovery, so and manifest destiny, and all of this kind of conquering out there, kind of colon colonizing kind of energy, and that's all being changed and wound back. You know, the whole um, energy of the USA is going to have to change it. Well, it's it's it, we can see it happening, and and it's like. And of course, we've had our Pluto return just because I I live here now, and I just almost think like it's a new birth for the United States in some way. Whether I don't know what's going to look like, but I do think it's 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 being reborn, and it had to go through all this chaos to be reborn, to get to be more human and caring and loving to go back to that um sabian symbol that we've got on this last eclipse as well because it has been rather conquering and domineering as a culture overall not to say there has not been good things about the usa i am not anti-usa i love living here it's a, great, it's a great country but also you know to even think of um when when the country was formed uh, there was manifest destiny, which incidentally uh, was coined as Neptune was discovered, um, <laughs> of of kind of this conquering light coming in and conquering the darkness, and that yeah. brings me back to the centaurs being half light, half dark, if you like, half yeah, human, half animal. Yeah, and mm -hmm. in a way, you know what you've just said about the USA. And mm -hmm. its origins, because mm -hmm. its origins are really close to when Uranus was discovered. Mm -hmm. So what you've described is almost like an example mm -hmm. of when we were talking about the orbit of Chiron, you know? Yes, yeah. Um, and the how the the attempt to leave the past behind mm -hmm. in, in one fell swoop or whatever doesn't really work. Because and ignoring what was there already as well. <laughs> exactly. And continually 
um, driving forward in such a way that everything that's behind mm -hmm. or lying outside that vision is mm -hmm. demonized in one way or another, you know. Yeah. So it creates a whole big split. It doesn't necessarily integrate or heal mm -hmm. anything. So that's the calling at the moment as I see it. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, the tendency of any colonial power actually to mm -hmm. feel a sense of righteousness, which is part of the drive to keep going and stay true to the vision and all that. And how that that whole uh, kind of meta narrative has to be dismantled in one way or another, mm -hmm. and I think that we're we're in a period of dismantling, major, major, major. Oh, oh, we are. And also, and, 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 uh, yeah, and it's reflected out everywhere, of course, in and everywhere. in us everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not just. And yeah, and yeah. we don't really know how long it's going to go on because we're we're referring to some very big mm -hmm. cycles. Oh, oh, we are. Oh, you know, yeah. this. Uh, if we stick with the centaurs, um, Cariclo and Chiron do not have their first square right till twenty forty one. I think there's only one there. So, and and so you know, and of course they're not the only. Um, planetary bodies or centaurs that are bringing in this healing process but I do think I you know even looking at all the other energies which I won't go into all of them but uh, but looking at the Venus star point cycle and all of those um, things where we're going I do think you know by probably about the early 2040s things will start to um, settle down a little bit and have we'll see where at least it's going that's how it feels to me anyway yeah I think yeah. That, that sort of sense of direction mm -hmm. is something really important but I think mm -hmm. you know it's a bit hazardous once we once we start trying to pin down what that actually is oh because, oh yeah because yeah. that can't be done prematurely and you know mm -hmm. um, Actually, you know, next weekend I'm, I'm doing a presentation which I gave it as a title, Are We There Yet? Oh. And of course, there's... A, there's we're, nev a, we're never there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that was specifically a reference to the age of Aquarius because ever since the mm -hmm. late 60s and oh. the musical hair, I mean, yeah. everybody back then was talking about the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. and pinpointing various dates, and that continues on. But yeah. in Nick Campion's marvellous book called The Book of World Horoscopes, mm -hmm. there's a whole chapter on the mm -hmm. age of Aquarius. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but what is so astounding. It gives a long list, it's pages and pages, of all the kind of worthies in, in the astrological field who have predicted the date on which oh, we're there, the yeah. age of Aquarius is, is, <laughs> is going to fall, you know. And the total span of all the, oh, and, you know, it's got the names and the ration, the astrological rationale, mm -hmm. and the source, mm -hmm. and everything, very scholarly. And yeah. the total range, which he quotes, it's 1,500 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like, well, maybe this month or next month or a couple of years. Now. It's 1,500 years. And then I've also done some research further back than his earliest mm -hmm. date. And it's so interesting. Um you know, I I I think the whole the whole meme of, you know, when it's gonna start oh, is a bit I suspect know. in a way. I um, I agree. If I it kind of fades in and one yeah, yeah, fades out. And, yeah. yeah. But what 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 I do think though is that the energies of Aquarius that we've been referring to mm -hmm. in one way or another, given that for decades now, there's always been at least one of the outer planets or a centaur or two mm -hmm. in Aquarius. And so mm -hmm. we've been, you know, getting bathed from the water bearers, mm -hmm. you know, like washing those energies <laughs> over us for decades already. And I'm going to share it. I'm just going to share an image with you, Melanie. And I have to thank 
uh, Naomi Bennett for this. I think it's Naomi Bennett. Do you know her, the astrologer? No, I don't. No, no. Anyway, she's uh, she's another astrologer. She pointed out that on our Sky Map, this is you know one of those apps. I've got Star Walk app. If you point your app at the eastern horizon every morning now, this is always what's rising. Um, the the Aquarius is always rising in the east, mm -hmm. no matter where you are at um, dawn. I don't know when it ha started to, because it will have changed over time. But there's the constellation, not the sign, because signs and constellations are different. For, I know Melanie knows that. I'm not telling her, telling the listeners. But there's the water bearer rising in the east now. So I think the age of Aquarius kind of is dawning, the constellation. But I had a thought when I looked at this image um, connected with... <laughs> the centaurs, of course, is that the water bearer, water is life, you know, the, as they say, uh, the indigenous peoples. And even though, every, you know, a lot of astrologers say we're moving into this age of air and we're moving into, you know, this age of um, exploration of outer space and colonization and things, the water bearer is pouring this down to earth, like the centaurs are going, no, you've got to bring it down to earth again that was my thought with that image oh, anyway. lovely lovely <laughs> so i'll stop the share but i was just like you know that i now i know why it's the water bearer <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it kind of never made sense in a way you and know? also you know aquarius <laughs> is a fixed sign so cool. yes yeah and it's an air sign mm -hmm. and you know air has a lot to do with communication mm-hmm um, well, perception and language and thought and thinking mm -hmm. and all related fields, you know. Yeah. And it's a fixed sign. So there, we're what we're looking at really are the fixed ideas. Yes. Which run yes. our lives. And, yes. you know, sometimes it's easy to look out in the world and see the fixed ideas in all their horrible glory. Oh, And yes. what the consequences are. Uh, mm -hmm. when people hang on to fixed ideas and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not so easy <laughs> to see into and really get a sense of the fixed ideas that we have lodged in our own minds. Oh, exactly. but some of them, Some of them were put there before we could even speak. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it's our conditioning. It is. That, in a way, is the Saturn part of Aquarius. It's our assumptions and our views and opinions and all of that, which are based on beliefs that may be completely unconscious. And, so, they're, and they're beliefs that have often held us back, limiting beliefs, self-limiting beliefs. Yeah. So, so to sort of mm -hmm. jump ship a bit here, but not quite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that this is one of the gifts of Pluto in Aquarius. Mm -hmm. Whatever else it might bring, on the historical political world stage, mm -hmm. inside our own hearts and minds, this is a real opportunity to really see mm -hmm. who, like who, who runs the show in here. <laughs> yes. And, and it's and, also and, also to talk about that mind and and the water bearer thing. It's 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 about integrating that knowing and the rational thought. Yeah, yeah it's, absolutely. It's almost like yeah. the 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 water bearer aspect of of that that image mm. comes into play almost when you've reached the end of your own understanding and you can't mm -hmm. go any more mm -hmm. in the same circuit that you've been in maybe all your life without even realizing it, mm -hmm. and then somehow this bringing in the element of water mm. sort of opens up a completely different kind of space which has a different kind of knowing in it it does it's not mm -hmm. knowing by fixed ideas or beliefs or anything like that it's the knowing of the heart you know yeah and you know, in the sequence of the zodiac because the next sign along is pisces mm -hmm. and <laughs> that's almost like the br the bridge is that the jug mm -hmm. of water, you know. Oh, and by the way, there's a mm -hmm. most amazing image of a female water bearer um, 
that it that was that can be found. It was the original poster for what became the Woodstock Festival. Absolutely oh, I think I've gorgeous. seen it somewhere. Maybe yes, I'll find maybe I'll find that image for the Woodstock and put that as the thumbnail on YouTube for this video when I upload it. So I'll I'll find that image of the uh, yeah and uh, put it on that thing. So I, we've gone. Whew, I knew we'd go ages, Melanie, as we always do. <laughs> but um, before we wrap up, to just circle back to where we began, this eclipse with mm. Chiron being exactly conjunct. If you could kind of just sum up how you feel Chiron's role is in this Aries eclipse after looking at the symbols and all of that, and with Aries being the first sign and all the things we've said about it. Oh, and incidentally, on the eclipse, Mars will be in Pisces by then. So Mars is softened as well, which I like, the ruler yes. of yes. Um, Aries. What do you think Chiron's role is in this? Eclipse. Well, you know, from what I've seen, mm. Chiron being so close to the nodal axis, so mm -hmm. it was exactly conjunct the nodal axis, de depending on which kind of node you use. But yeah. it was the fifth, on the 5th of this month, so March mm -hmm. 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, if you, if you look at that conjunction over a longer period, you'll see that really the whole the whole of the first six months of this year have Chiron conjunct the nodal axis. Mm -hmm. So what I've been noticing is that people are coming across healing teachings, healing people, mentors, or just simply healing experiences in a wonderful kind of serendipitous way mm. a lot. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I not. So it's it's more than what one could expect if somebody had that on their natal chart as a transit. This is a mm. collective transit, you know. So yeah. there is there is a lot of healing energy around. And also, I think with Chiron, the whole notion of healing very much needs to include our mortality. That's the story of Chiron. He only became freed when he traded places with Prometheus. And that was like a gesture of accepting his mortality, mm -hmm. which he wasn't free to do before. And what that looks like in real terms is that, you know, all of us are going to die mm -hmm. at some point or another. And as I've heard from Buddhist teachers, there's only two things in life that we can be sure about. One is that we will die, and two is that we don't know when. <laughs> and so <laughs> healing in a Chiron way is also about becoming free of the kind of mental tyranny mm -hmm. about what healing looks like. It's not mm -hmm. about fixing what is broken. No. It's a whole other process that includes that includes our mortality. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, the whole way that Western medicine has developed is very much along the heroic lines, battling yeah. the disease, fighting against the disease. It's in the language, you know. It, oh, it is. Fight but cancer. That's something oh. else. Yes, yes. <laughs> but this is, this is something else. Mm -hmm. And here I'm thinking of the marvelous work of Stephen Levine, who sadly died mm -hmm. a few years back, mm -hmm. where... And the title of the book that comes to mind is Healing into Life and Death. So he describes how somebody can be fixed medically mm -hmm. and completely unhealed in their soul mm -hmm. and vice versa. Even if we die of our disease, we can die completely yeah. healed in our soul. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm finding that you know, m many of us may have begun by having those two mixed up. Definitely. So expecting that healing is going to be about fixing what's wrong. Um, or it's going to cure something so it won't bother me anymore. And even worse, 
and if that doesn't happen somehow i have failed yes i know we we do have some of the most punishing ideas oh and about, about um about what healing and, is so this and about con continuing life at any cost as well you know uh, yes yes exactly yes yeah and that you know that's almost a distortion of the fact well there is continuity of life yes people this endless discussion about is there life after death and all that well <laughs> the the subtlety of the fact that well yes of course there is life mm -hmm. after death but we won't be in the, the same body that we've inhabited exactly. this time around so to, so to speak <laughs> And yes. so it's like a broadening of the view mm -hmm. about those th crucial themes to do with healing. Yeah. And I've, I've seen an, so much of this an, on. There's another author you might like um, if you've not come across him, Stephen Jenkinson. I've actually seen him talk, giving a talk live. He wrote a most amazing book, and I like it on Audible because his voice is 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 lovely stephen jenkinson die wise he was in the death oh. business he says he was a you know a, a, a help people you know die and and he just saw you know he said you know we need to come to terms with the fact that part of being human is death and yeah. you can choose to die wise or you can choose otherwise he said so. <laughs> yeah yeah and you know the yeah. quest the quest for our immortality mm -hmm is so much of what I would call progressism. Yes. It's dominated oh, it is. world it culture to, for yeah. centuries now. Yeah. And, you know, that I think is beginning to get dismantled. Mm. Um, thank so thank heaven. All these changes, <laughs> of, changes of view mm -hmm. belong with, Chiron conjunct the node and the sextiles. Yeah. Uh, with with Chariclo. Now, the eclipse, you know, all eclipses, both lunar and solar, they are markers of endings. Yes. And the endings that they're referring to would be very individual, of course, mm -hmm. depending on where they sit in your chart and what kind of aspects and all that. But, you know, if one tunes in to the energy of an eclipse, it's usually very obvious. And it can range from something that's very subtle and invisible so that you're the only one who knows that there's been an ending. It could, could be a, a subtle shift of perspective, a shift within a relationship where you know that a phase has ended. That doesn't mean that the relationship has ended necessarily. So all these really subtle things that become more available to us around eclipse times. So mm -hmm. very enriching. And sometimes the eclipses are, um, they mark really dramatic endings, things that are really in your face. Sometimes yeah. that come completely out of left field and you had no idea about that. It just occurs. Yeah. So on an individual level, those kind of eclipse experiences will, will will usually occur only when an eclipse is sitting exactly on one of your planets or in a very tight yeah. aspect to something else. Um, and that, you know, it will need to be a really close, tight aspect, and then you can really see that kind of manifestation. So the rule of thumb there is the closer an eclipse falls, Mm. onto one of your own planetary placements, the more obvious it, its manifestations might be. But even with an orb of about five degrees either side, you'll, you'll feel it maybe more uh, more consciously and so forth. Uh, but well, the, I... way, the way I like to approach eclipse times is to just leave space yeah. for whatever the process is is going to be for you in your own individual life. And it can be very deepening and enriching. Well, I can tell you it's been, I, often we feel eclipses as they come close as well. And not only is, is this eclipse combined with my sec, 
third pass of my exact second Uranus square, this eclipse forms a, a very tight fire grand trine with my uh, Uranus in Leo and my Sagittarius sun. And the kind of profound, almost um, burning off, I would say, of some mm -hmm. very old, old stuff has a beautiful phrase, all, yeah. has already been happening for me. And, oh. you know, I, I look forward to, you know, more of it kind of disappear. I feel um, it literally, Melanie, I've actually um, also kind of shed two gene sizes <laughs> and I'm not really oh. dieting. I'm not well, really so, dieting. So, so you're, I, feel like, I'm, I feel like I'm being reborn almost, you know. Well, <laughs> so it's very yeah. it's very literal in that way you're burning yes. off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and well, i'm not well, really you know, trying <laughs> so in a couple of days on march the 25th mm -hmm. um will be um the, the lunar Friday, eclipse which yeah. will be this time around a lunar eclipse mm -hmm. and so we are actually as i would understand it we are already in the eclipse season mm -hmm. so typically there's one solar and one lunar, lunar eclipse, and they will be on a on a new moon and a full moon, respectively, so mm -hmm. two weeks apart. And mm -hmm. so an eclipse season is how I usually think of it. And I, I sort of count it just for convenience. A week before the first eclipse in the pair mm -hmm. and a week after the second one. So it's a, it's actually a month. It can even be that there's more than one of the solar or lunar eclipses, which really stretches out. Yes. Typically, those, yeah. those are years when a lot of stuff happens and not all of it is easy. Mm -hmm. Like there was one of them in the middle of the pandemic. There were six eclipses that year, I think. Certainly five, maybe six. So uh, what that means is that twice a year, every year, there's a month. So six months apart, there's mm -hmm. a month which is strongly colored by the eclipses that are going on. And they won't always be the same because it depends yeah. on our individual horoscope, but that's the way I like to approach them. I and do. So I, I call it like the season too. Yeah. Sorry? I call Would it the, the season too, the or the... Perfect yeah, word. Yeah. yeah. The eclipse yeah. season. Mm -hmm. And I even try to be mindful of that in terms of what I schedule and what I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know so i like I, I like to try and schedule things in such a way that i i i open up enough space and time mm -hmm. for the inner space to, to be recognized well cultivated recognized etc and so for many of us that will mean doing less <laughs> yes I definitely um, agree. I do. I do a lot less during eclipses. I leave a yeah. lot of space for my own kind of, especially when the the eclipses are really um, aspecting my chart as uh, both of them are actually. But um, I, I do want to mention this lunar eclipse is at five Libra um, Aries because it's a full moon. And that's where Mars and Saturn sat on Caraclo's discovery chart. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. Isn't it? You know, I I really think, you know, the old, as you called it, you know, the old culture, the well, we've talked about it, the patriarchal, whatever you want to call it, is ending over time. But it's kind of all coming to the surface to be ended. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess maybe a good <laughs> phrase, um, a good phrase for a solar eclipse, would would maybe be happy endings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, like the that. Sense of, like the sense of happy birthday, you know. Yeah, definitely. And I I definitely feel it. I feel I feel nothing but, and and I'm not saying there's not going to be chaos and more, you know, stuff. But, you know, like Melanie said, you just don't get, don't sit in the news, you know, don't sit in the horrors of what's going on. Doesn't mean don't be aware of what's going on.
But a lot of this stuff is coming up, I think, so that we can change. Even the Middle East, you know, that's an, uh, an ancient, ancient battle, if you like, being replayed again. And and it's awful. And yes, I'm, you know, ceasefire, please. <laughs> but um, but energetically, a lot of this is rising up again uh, mm. and to, to, to change and shift, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Melanie. I know it's uh, getting late thank for you. It's probably your dinner time and things, but... Uh, thank uh, you, Louise, as always. Yeah. It's lovely to just chat with you. It is with you. That's how it feels. I know everybody's listening, but um, I'm sure we'll do it again as well as we get Absolutely. more ideas. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to stop recording and thank you, everybody, for listening. Bye, mm -hmm. and thank you, everybody.